morning. It is yes, okay. Good morning. It's with great pleasure that I get to introduce Serena Ferguson, Dr. Serena Ferguson. She got her PhD in 2015 when I was her patient. Um, and I've been her patient a number of times, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> she's keeping me uh, mobile. Anyway, uh, she started here at OSPT in 2014, and now she owns it as of last week. Yay. So today um, she's going to talk about hips and the good, bad, and the ugly. And um, uh, I, well, let me tell you one little story. She's a former gymnast, and so she actually works with the gymnastics folks um, on Wednesdays, uh, making sure that they stay safe and healthy and don't hurt themselves, the, the kids that are doing gymnastics now. I think that's a pretty w cool way to give back. Anyway, so here she is. Can we hear me now? Okay, there we go. So we'll just use this. That's okay. So this is what I look like without a mask. Nobody's really seen that for the last, you know, year and a half. Um, let's see. Let me get this going. And my screen is sharing. So here we go. Where did my screen share go? So sorry. <laughs> Up and ready. <laughs> okay, here we go. So, who already introduced me? I am Serena Ferguson. I am one of the physical therapists that actually is with OSPT. Um, we have two clinics. One is in Oakmont, the other one's on Farmer Lane. Um, as she mentioned, I just recently purchased it. I've been the owner for a week. The deal's been in the way um, since February. So I've been with the company a long time. Um, got my degree at Sacramento State as well as um, went back to school and got my degree at A.T. Still University in the doctorate um, in 2015. So this is just a little bit about me, but Sue kind of wrapped it up pretty good. <laughs> um, so today, um, we're going to be talking about hips. Um, for the most part, we're going to be talking about um, prevention and rehabilitation of hip fractures, as well as um, exploring some exercises and some balance, um, strength, flexibility to prevent hip fractures, as well as um, things that we could do around the house to be a little bit safer. And then um, basically, a lot of times I see patients coming in that don't know how to use their assistive, assistive device properly. Um, so a little bit about walkers and trek poles and the canes. 
Um, so we'll go over all of that today and hopefully um, I won't fill you in with too, too much stuff, um, but that's the gist of it for today. So hip fractures, um, they generally occur with a fall. Um, it's because basically some outside force to the either the thigh, um, that femur or the pelvis. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a big fall. It could just be just standing and falling um, could be enough of a force to fracture that hip. Um, and the most common place to fracture the hip is actually in one of two places, um, either the um, femoral neck or the uh, intertrochanteric region. So for the people in the audience, I have live videos or live um, at the Burger Center. I have the live um, hip display here. Um, and in a moment, I'm gonna flip to the picture. so You can actually see it if you are um, on the screen. So this is a femoral neck fracture. You could see it's basically right where the ball in the socket happens. Um, this force can happen from a fall. Um, that's generally what it uh, is caused by, um, a fall onto the ground. Um, doesn't look too pleasant, looks pretty painful. Um, so that is the femoral neck. And then the other most common place is the intertrochanteric. The intertrochanteric one's a little bit more risky because this is where a lot of the muscles of the hip attach to. And so that becomes a little bit more of a problem um, when you're rehabbing versus the femoral neck. It's a nice, easy, clean break. This one, unfortunately, is so close to all of those muscles that move the hip in different directions that a lot of people have a little bit longer time of a rehab. And when you have a fall, it's just gonna break wherever the bone's the weakest. So it's not that one fall is gonna be worse than another. It's just wherever the force managed to break your bone at the weakest spot. So you can't fall any specific way to get the surgical neck versus the intertrochanteric ne uh, fracture, unfortunately. I'd prefer nobody to fall though, um, ideally. <laughs> So some interesting statistics on falls. Um, basically, one in four people fall, elderly adults. That's 25% of older adults fall every year. That's huge. About every 11 seconds, an older adult is treated in the emergency department for a fall. Um, it's the leading cause of fatal and non-fatal injuries in older adults. And sadly, these um, injuries can be life-threatening at times too. So every 19 minutes, an older adult has, um, has a death sometimes from these complications after a fall. So it's pretty serious to, to not fall. And that's what we'll be talking about in the second half of this presentation. Um, as we get older, the ratio of reasons why people are hospitalized is five times more for fall-related issues than any other cause, which is pretty startling. So the fear of falling is the last little portion that I thought was a really interesting statistic. And if anybody's almost had a close call or had a, had a fall, usually you're pretty afraid of falling again. It becomes one of those um, awareness things that you didn't think about before. And unfortunately, that fear of falling after a close call or after a fall becomes something that actually will increase your fall risk factor, which a lot of people don't realize. But just the act of being afraid of falling increases your fall risk, which is pretty crazy. Um, and then usually it leads to that physical decline because you don't want to do the activities that you might be afraid of doing because you're afraid of falling. So then you're home more add a pandemic into the mix and you're pretty much stuck at home and it can be pretty isolating and depressing all from just being afraid of falling. So that's partly why it's something that we wanna make sure we take time to think about what can we do to prevent some of these falls and what are some good exercises um, towards the end of this presentation to help reduce some of that so we don't get into this lovely little spiral. Um, so falls, can come from a variety of things. People ask, why do we fall? Well, there's a lot of things that can lead to a fall. There's a few systems that help with our balance, in particular, the visual, the inner ear, and then our proprioception. Also, just weakness 
unfortunately. If you're just weak, it can also lead to a fall. So those are the four most common ingredients in the recipe to fall, unfortunately. Um, sometimes it's just an environmental issue, such as an external force, like the dog pulled me and we fell. We get quite a few of those patients that come through. Um, but for today's purpose, because I'm not a dog trainer, I'm, I'm a physical therapist, um, we'll be talking a little bit more about the things that we can help with. So the things like the strength and the um, balance training, the proprioception, and then the safety around the house, things that you can actually change around the house um, because we can't always get the dog to behave, okay? Or the cat, the cat's another one that sometimes gets you. Okay, so the first thing on that list was weakness. So generalized weakness can contribute to falls. If we think about it, the, the strength is basically our infrastructure. So our bones and muscles, they're kind of like the infrastructure of a building. If our bones and muscles are not strong, it's a really shaky building. And so you're more likely to fall. So that's one thing that we want to think about. The other thing is, is that um, if your bones and, and muscles are strong, they're more dense and you're less likely to actually have a fracture from a fall. So it's not just that can it hold you up, but also if they're nice and strong, are they gonna be able to withstand that force a little bit better? So that bone strength and muscle strength really are very important as we get older because there is a natural decline. The one cool thing though about the human body is that bones and muscle are living structures. So if you use them, if you feed them, if you work them, they stay strong. They can get stronger too. So even if you've had the last year, like the most of us where we've been home, sheltering in place, you can get those muscles stronger again. You can get your bones a little bit stronger again and basically kind of shift it to your favor for being able to be a little bit better with that infrastructure, okay? So the next thing on our list was the visual system. Physical therapists don't change much with the visual system, but we do like to kind of help encourage how to use it properly. Um, unfortunately, the aging process in this one kind of works against us as well. So as we get older, our vision usually isn't as great as it was when we were younger. Um, so that kind of can impair some of that um, information up to the brain. So lower lighting type of areas, dim lighting, that's when we're gonna have a little bit more of a challenge. Um, and that's just, you know, natural aging, unfortunately. Night lights become really helpful at night and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, the other thing that a lot of people don't think about until maybe you've tried those multifocal glasses where you have those transitional lenses, they actually do present a balance um, risk factor because there's different areas that you're gonna be um, looking for and they actually can give a mismatch if you happen to be looking in the wrong area as you get used to your transition lenses. Most people have issues when they're switching prescriptions for this, and then you kind of acclimate and get better at it. It's just something to be aware of. If you all of a sudden get a new prescription, you may find that the mismatch is a little bit more in the beginning for a little bit until you get used to it. So just be cautious, okay? And then the one thing that I've really noticed while I've been working with my patients the last year and a half with COVID is we are all masked. And those masks present this lovely little visual disturbance from, from your nose down that we never paid attention to before. And so that unfortunately also causes a little bit of a challenge because you're missing some of our peripheral vision. And what I'm also noticing with my patients is and then they look down at their feet and then they're shifting their, their center of gravity and they're over their base of support and all that fun. So hopefully, Maybe in the spring of next year, we can get rid of all these masks and that little billet point can go away. <laughs> but until then, just be aware that when you're wearing a mask, you don't get to see what's in front of you as well. So you may trip over a throw rug or something that you weren't usually anticipating being there. <laughs> the inner ear is another component of balance that we deal with in physical therapy. So. Um, it's also known as the vestibular system. So the vestibular system is, is composed of the semicircular canals. Each one of those canals basically kind of gives our head an awareness as to where our body is. Is it upright? Is it sideways? Are we 
accelerating? Are we going up in the elevator? And it does that all without any visual input. So that's done with fluid in that inner ear and it moves the little tiny cells, the little hair cells in there. And basically that fluid kind of gets relayed, that movement gets relayed to the brain. Oh, we just accelerated really fast, zero to 60. Or, oh, the elevator stopped um, without any visual cue. So it usually works pretty good. Unfortunately, another cruel joke that nature plays on us is as we get older, that fluid, which was nice and watery when we were younger, it actually gets to be a little bit more viscous as we get older. And unfortunately, that slowness then moves the hair cells slower, which gives a mismatch to your visual system. When there's that mismatch, that's when you get that kind of car sick, dizzy feeling. Some people, when it gets really out of place and there's some otoliths that actually get awry, go out of place, you can get that vertigo sensation. So it can be anywhere on that spectrum from that little bit of that catch up, that kind of car sickness feel to when it's really out of whack, it can get into that vertigo sensation where you're just not sure which is up or down because the eyes and the ears are just not talking to the brain in the same way. And so that obviously can, can impair your balance if you don't know, are you right side up, are you upside down, or are we going fast or slow? Um, physical therapy does work a little bit with the inner ear. There are some vestibular specialists in uh, Sonoma County. So um, if you are having vertigo, feel free to ask questions later. I can direct you to the right place. For today, we won't be talking much more about actual vertigo other than that it is a cause, unfortunately, for some of these balance mismatches. It's a whole other area of physical therapy. We could do a whole nother talk on it. <laughs> All right. So the last one, um, proprioception, that is basically, you know, your body, your awareness in space. So usually athletes have some really good proprioception. They know exactly where they are. They know where the ball is. They're in relation. Um, so as we get older, unfortunately, we don't tend to rely on that information. So each joint, each, all of your skin, all of those send up information to the brain as to is my arm outside to the right? Is it down by my side? Are my feet on an even surface? Are they on an uneven surface? Is it squishy? And so all of those little um, inputs into the joints from, from the toes up to the, the, the head basically give your brain ideas to what type of environment you are in and what your body is doing. Unfortunately, as we get older, sometimes our circulation diminishes, or sometimes we just get a neuropathy that occurs with sciatica, diabetes, all of those, unfortunately, will also reduce our input. So if that's <laughs> diminished, have less sensation in your feet because you have bad circulation or one of those other things I mentioned, we're <coughs> likely to have some lack of information, which is going to unfortunately also make it harder for you to balance. It's not going to make you fall. It's just going to make you have less information to stay upright. Okay. Gymnasts have great proprioception. I used to be one. So we stand on those balance means we know just how wide it is. That's why I used my little gymnast picture over there. Um, okay. So prevention, this is probably why most of you are curious to be here today. So exercise is medicine. Um, time and time again, study and study after study, they keep showing that exercise is wonderful, whether it's for strengthening and reducing falls or Parkinson's, they just keep showing study after study that study after study that our bodies were designed to move. And so that's really, really important. So 2008, they had... Um, basically a huge combination of uh, studies. And it looked at basically two things that we really need to focus on. One is aerobic exercise. So that's the huffing and puffing. That's the, the walking fast and the swimming and whatnot. And the other is strength training. They both need to be done in order to prevent falls and to improve your balance. So the guidelines currently, they have it kind of open to uh, it, uh, a fluidity. So they kind of lump all the minutes together in a week. So about 150 minutes of moderate intensity or 75 of vigorous. You can kind of choose how many minutes you want to do in each setting. So I usually tell my patients, if you can set aside 25 to 30 minutes a day to get your heart rate up and you can add in weights twice a week or resistance twice a week, that basically covers the guideline. And then you're going to get your 150 minutes. 
most of us are good with the moderate intensity. Not a lot of people like vigorous anymore, which is totally fine. I am a moderate intensity myself. <laughs> so when we talk about aerobic exercise. Aerobic exercise is training that is a sustained activity. So it is 25 minutes of just trying to stay with your heart rate up and your pulmonary demand up. So you should be a little bit heavy breathing. It shouldn't be comfortable. It needs to be a little bit outside of your comfort zone. So brisk walking is great. Swimming laps or water aerobics is great. Cycling, um, any of the cardio fitness stuff at the Oakmont uh, Fitness Center is wonderful as well. Bottom line is you wanna find something you like. I have patients that like to dance. So Zumba is their thing. Um, some people like to um, run after the grandkids. It just really depends on what is fun for you. Hiking is another good one as we have Annadale nearby and all of the parks, um, but it needs to be sustained. So walking the dog, if it's not getting you out of breath, unfortunately is not considered aerobic exercise. It's considered an activity of daily living especially if you have a dog like what mine used to do that had to sniff every blade to find the perfect one. Um, you're doing more standing than you are walking, unfortunately. So think about that when you're thinking, am I being an active adult or am I exercising? Because an active adult is the one that walks the dog twice a day. An exercising person is one that says, all right, I'm gonna go out and walk around the block for 15 minutes and I'm gonna get a little bit tired and out of breath with this. Not a lot, just a little, little, little huffing and a little puffing, okay? And so the second one is the one that you wanna aim for if you wanna make a bit of a change, okay? So that's a little bit about aerobic exercise. Next, we're gonna talk about strength training. So muscle strength training, again, it's that focused activity to intentionally increase stress on a muscle. You wanna feel it fatigue. So that's that, that little bit of a burn, that little bit of, of that warmth in the muscle, okay? You can do this in a variety of ways. If you're at the fitness center, they have all the weight machines. Most people at home will use either little tiny hand weights or the little resistance bands. If you're in the water, you can use the water to push it back and forth and that gives you some turbulence resistance, which is also really, really good. So there's a lot of varieties for this. Again, this is something that needs to be actively done and repetitive in nature. Um, and it actually needs to be more of a load than your normal activities of daily living. So I sometimes get ladies in that have osteoporosis and they're afraid to lift a two pound weight. And I always think that's kind of funny because I look at their purse and their purse is about 10 pounds. And I think, wow, okay, two pounds is scary, but you can reach into the refrigerator and grab the gallon of milk and you can lift your purse. And so once we kind of start to think that, oh, wow, yeah, that is okay, that is safe. Five pounds is okay, eight pounds is okay. I've done it before, the cat weighs eight pounds, I can lift them up once or twice. So once or twice, you probably won't feel a muscle burn, but if you were to lift, that gallon of milk 10 times, you'd feel that muscle burn. And so it's totally appropriate and safe. So anywhere between zero and 10 pounds that you can find at home is usually gonna be totally fine and not going to risk osteoporosis um, for those people who are a little afraid of that. But it should give you that burn. So again, we wanna think about, am I just being active cleaning the house and, and doing things around the house? Or am I actively trying to do this pull 10 times to get that muscle burn? And then that becomes an exercise. So that's that transition from activity to exercise is that I'm focusing that I wanna get that tired. I wanna do 10 of those instead of just one, okay? You can be active and you can exercise and they're just, you can change one into the other, which is kind of neat. So balance training is another one. So this is that ability to, to try and, or what you're trying to do is basically stabilize yourself. Um, and you're using that proprioception to try and stabilize yourself and be aware of where you are in space. So the thing with balance training that gets a lot of people scared, which is why they come in to see a physical therapist often, is because we're actually getting you to be uncomfortable with way, how you're standing. So it's a controlled venture outside of your comfort zone is what I call it. 
So we're basically forcing you to feel a little uncomfortable to stabilize so you get better at it. And so quite often people will do that with a physical therapist because we're there to help you. We're there to spot you if needed. And we're there to also coach you and let you know that it's okay to feel a little uncomfortable. We're right here. Um, so that's balance training um, in a nutshell. Um, we'll go over some activities that you can do safely at home before the end of the day today as well. Then stretching exercises, you can do tons of stretching, but today I just focus mostly on the postural ones that I'm thinking about. So if our posture is horrible and it's because we just don't stretch, that's gonna change your plume line. That's gonna change how your spine is aligned with gravity and your center of mass and your base of support. So whether it's bad posture because you hunch forward or you have a scoliosis, all of those can change your balance point. So those are things that if you can combat some of that and have better posture, you're gonna have a little bit better balance just because you're standing up taller. I like to tell my patients, think about trying to balance a banana. If you're hunched forward like a banana, it's really hard to set it on its end and balance it. But if you were a thick dowel and you were trying to stand it up, you'd have a much better chance. So we wanna try and get more upright and less hunched, not be bananas, okay? And usually that visual kind of is like, oh yeah, it would be really hard to balance a banana. <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit about exercises that are gonna be great for, for posture today as well, okay? So what can we do? Strength training, bands, weight machines, free weights, just stuff around the house. You can lift your purse 15 times if it's got some good weight. You can lift um, all sorts of things. So balance exercises, we'll look at these in a moment. Um, single leg stands, tandem stands, weight shifting and line walks are pretty common and safe. We'll go over those in a moment as well. Stretching exercises, we wanna think about that posture. So these are the, 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 the key take home points. And then lastly, home safety, what can we do? So tripping hazards, they kind of come around the house and we don't sometimes think about it. So this is where I like to think about how many throw rugs do we have and how many do we really need? So throw rugs and area rugs, they're not bad in certain locations, but they do present a risk factor. So if it's outside of the shower or in front of the sink or in front of an entryway, very good because it reduces the rainy, slippery, watery stuff that they usually associate with all those aforementioned areas. If it's just an area rug that's a runner down the hall, it just becomes a more of a risk factor. So those are things to think about that you could trip over and fall from the outside force, but that's something that you might be able to adjust at home, okay? The other thing that a lot of people don't think about is their slippers or their shoes. If your shoe is like mine here and it doesn't have a back, it actually becomes more of a risk factor you wanna have a shoe that actually goes onto the back. And that goes for slippers too around the house. So the slides are nice because they're easy to get into, but because of the nature of them, you can slide off to the side and then you can go over. So whether it's a shoe or a slipper, that's something to think about. And that's something that you might wanna transition into something that's a little bit more secure and has some heel support. Same with sandals. We're kind of getting out of sandal weather, but you want that sling back on the back. So the sandals are okay, but you want to have that heel support to keep your heel in the shoe. It's going to reduce your risk factor. Thankfully, a lot of people have gotten out of wearing the heels all the time. So that's not as big of an issue, but anytime you add a heel, that's also something that's going to increase your risk factor, um, whether it's a boot or um, for, you know, walking around or a cowboy boot or a, a heel to a nice um, event. Just be aware that your balance is gonna be a little more compromised. So things that you can do at the house as well is you can think about, do I have appropriate railings and ramps? Luckily, most of the people out of Oakmont, we live on very flat, flat type of um, environments. Um, but if you do not have, and you have a step up into the house, you can always attach a railing if you don't have one or a ramp if you have that one or two steps in. And those become nice and helpful um, just to reduce um, the risk of falls, as well as thinking about that step from the garage. I know some of the houses out here have that step down into the garage. So think about, do I have a railing there? 
Um, is it, it, would it be a bit available to, in, uh, to place one in the house to be a little bit safer, just so you have something. Grab bars in the bathroom, quite often. Most of the houses out here, people have put them in, but if you haven't, they become in really handy. So um, I do recommend actually having them professionally installed as opposed to the suction cup ones. The suction cup ones, they're nice because you can move them, but they don't always withstand a whole lot of pull in the event that you actually grab it and you're about to go down. So having one that's really put into the shower or into the wall on an actual stud of the, of the bathroom is safer, okay? Um, and then shower benches are very cumbersome, but if you're afraid of losing your balance, the shower benches are nice. Um, some people can't fit the shower bench into their shower or their tub. And so I usually recommend to people is if you can't fit it in, see if you can get one of those plastic garden chairs um, at one of the like Ace or, or Home Depot, the smaller ones, um, those sometimes fit in and they're very waterproof um, and they become the shower chair in the event that the bigger bench doesn't fit in your stall shower or your bath. Um, we came into that problem when my dad had, had a stroke that we had to use the, the, uh, the $10 version versus the glorified medical um, bench that didn't fit. It was eye-opening to see what does and does not work from the medical field when you get it into real life home. Okay, so examples of some strength exercises. So I put up on here a few exercises. And so some of these have bands and some of them don't. Some of them have a ball. Um, the resistance bands you can get pretty easily at um, one of the sporting goods stores, Dick's Sporting Goods or um, any one of the uh, sport marts or whatever it's been renamed to. Um, but they're usually just a, a glorified rubber band. They work great. Um, you can tie them around, gently tie them, and then you can move them as needed. Um, so up in the top corner up there um, on the, the left, uh, it's around the ankle and you can do exercises where you go backwards with your leg or sideways with your leg or forward with your leg. All of those pull right on the hip. Those are great for the hip. Those are great to prevent falls because that uses that muscle around the hip, that one up in the upper left. Um, as well as the one below it goes forward and then the one out to the side. The other one that's really good is actually just doing a mini squat. So a lot of people that have bad knees don't want to do a squat, but you don't have to go all the way down. You can go with just part way. So just a little down and up. And if you stick your hips back more so than your knees forward, usually you don't have knee problems with that. If you stick your butt back, it actually changes the mechanism to where you don't have as much stress on the knee joint. And then you work the thigh muscle, which is really important for, for keeping your balance. The one on the, on the upper right is the upper, is the, the heel lift, which is really, really good. Just up and down, doing about 20 of those is very, very effective. It works a little bit for balance, but it also works your calf muscle, which is really important for keeping, keeping you upright and propelling you forward with walking. And the one on that lower left, over, the lower right over there is the little ball squeeze. Not everybody has a bouncy ball, um, but you can use a towel or a stuffed pillow and that works the inner thigh. So if you were to do just these exercises on the screen twice a week, you would get the entire circumference of the leg, the front side in and out and back and the upper and the lower thighs. And these would be the bare minimum exercises that I'd recommend to anybody just for strengthening their legs. Strength training is usually two sets of 10 reps. So you wanna be a little tired with two sets of 10 reps, okay? So the resistance band is what's gonna get you to be a little tired at that 10th one, just a little bit of muscle burn. Because if you are fairly healthy, and I saw most of you guys all walked in here looking pretty good, doing 10 of these without any resistance probably isn't gonna feel like anything. So in the audience today, you guys would probably all benefit from having the resistance band, whereas somebody who hasn't maybe ventured out of the home or is more homebound, they might just be able to feel that 10th one being tired with just their body weight because your leg weighs a lot. We don't think about it until you go to lift it 10 times in a row. So these are some balance exercises. I gave 
two options. So you have the seated version for those people who are too afraid to get up, the people that are just like, I don't feel comfortable. And so you can actually work on your balance, say seated, you work a little bit trunk balance. So you can sit to the edge of the chair and you can do some simple marches and some kicks and some reaches without your back on the backrest. That actually works your balance pretty good for those people who are a little afraid to stand up and, and actually venture out of the seated version. You can also, when you're feeling a little bit more brave, just try and move an object, nothing, nothing too heavy or crazy, but from the floor and to the bench next to you. The act of actually shifting your right forward and up a few times gets you to be a little bit more confident with that, which actually transfers into you getting up out of a chair feeling more confident. So those are the easier versions for people who are a little afraid to stand. Now, when you are comfortable with standing, there's a few things you can do. One is the tandem stand, which is basically imagining you're like on a tightrope and just trying to balance for 30 seconds. That's all you gotta do, 30 seconds. And then switch feet and put the other foot in front. So I usually recommend to do this next to the counter the first time, just because you have something. Kitchen counters are great because you can grab onto the sink. Um, so that's a good safe place to start. If you're feeling really good about that, try then to stand on one foot for 30 seconds. It's harder than it seems like it should be. So say you only get five seconds, that's okay. Just try and count, get your balance again, and then go six, seven, eight, nine till you can't, and then get work your way up to 30. If you keep practicing and you keep trying and you go slow with it and you really think about trying to stabilize, it will get better over time. And so you'd wanna do that on each side as well. And so I'd recommend that to be done at the kitchen counter as well, or the bathroom counter, just because again, nice and stable, counters are attached to the wall. The chairs, they might go with you, but a counter is gonna stay there. So if you do grab it, it's ready, ready to hold you versus a chair that could topple over with you, which would not be good, okay? So these are some stretches that are more designed for posture. So unfortunately, the world we live in is very electronic, which is great because I can talk to people that are not here in the audience, but are at home through Zoom. But unfortunately, it also causes us to do this kind of hunched forward posture. That hunched forward posture is seen everywhere now with our cell phones, our tablets, our laptops, everything is bringing us forward. It used to just be kind of books and cards now it's everything. So all of the exercises for, the, for, for most of my posture patients is just reversing that, going into that open posture. So it seems really funny, but backward shoulder rolls are great. Just doing those throughout the day. I tell my patients who have this big hunch forward to just do that with each meal, 10 shoulder rolls backwards. Don't worry about the forwards. You're doing that all day long with all your other stuff. Just do the backwards, that's all you need. And so that's one good one to do throughout the day. The other one is you can use the doorway. Open your arms up, bring them down a little bit and get that nice open stretch. Again, everything's in front. So that doorway stretch in the middle right there is really, really good. Pinching your shoulder blades together over in the um, lower left side is also really good. Just trying to pinch the shoulder blades back, opening that chest up again. All of these exercises are really easy and we don't think too much of it. <laughs> until we are told we have bad posture. Um, and then if you look in the lower right-hand corner, again, there's that little rubber band that's coming back in. And you can do some little resistance with that to try and get those shoulders to open up. It's also a good rotator cuff exercise. If anybody has rotator cuff injuries, this exercise is a really good one in that lower right corner there to basically try and get the rotator cuff involved a little bit too. So those are some great stretches. Um, that middle one on the bed is also another nice one to do. Very easy for anybody. Um, but most of these can be done seated with the exception of the doorway one. So if you're not up and mobile, you can also do these seated or lying down. So it doesn't necessarily need to be standing. Okay, the last thing we'll talk about is the cane use. So I'm gonna go through the two slides and then I'll have um, them video me with the actual live um, uh, walker and cane just so you guys can kind of see. So the take home with this is that canes and walkers 
either you're using them on the wrong side or they're either too high or too low. Those are the biggest things that was physical therapists see when you come in. So a lot of people want them higher because they're thinking, ah, oh, I'm not going to lean forward. My posture is going to be better. Unfortunately, that raises the center of gravity and you become less stable. So if the walker or the cane is too high, you actually have less stability. If it's too low, you guys could probably guess you're going to lean forward like we're all afraid of, and then you're going to be off balance because you're leaning forward down to it. So those are the two things that we have to battle when people come in with the height. The other icky thing is that unfortunately, TV and movies and Hollywood has really not helped people to understand what side the cane needs to be on when it's a cane. So the cane is not a device to replace the injured body part or the weak body part or the body part that's just not working great. It's actually meant to offset that side. So you want to have it on the opposite side of your ailment, whether it's that it's weak or it hurts. You actually want it on the opposite side so you get away from the alley, not leaning towards it. And then you actually will walk a little bit safer and better with your balance. People that are just using a cane or truck poles for balance purposes only and don't have an owie or they don't have a, a weak spot, you can choose whichever side it works best for or whatever side feels better to you. Or you can switch it depending on the environment. If you're walking down the street and you have to switch because it gets narrow and there's another person coming, you can switch it. So if you don't have an ailment, you have a whole lot more flexibility with it. Um, but if you do have issues, you want to think about using on the opposite side of the, the, the involved side, okay? So I think what we'll do right here is we could switch to um, the video. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Turn off my screen share? Okay. Technology. Okay, there we go. So I brought in a cane today. Good old trusty cane. So in the picture, it showed a person having it at their wrist. So with me, if you see, this is too tall for me. It's too tall by a few inches. If it's too tall, when I go to lean on it, my arm actually doesn't hold me up as good as it could because my elbow's too bent. So we would actually want this to be a little bit lower so that it fits me perfectly. It'd be right on that area where your wrist and your hand meet, okay? Now, if I had a sore left foot, I'd use it on the right side. Say I had some arthritis or that knee was just not working for the day or, or I have some, some injury. If you use it on the opposite side, I end up actually getting away from that pain and I can bear down a little bit better on it. If I were to use it on the same side, I'd end up actually, I'll switch here. I would use it and look what happens. I'm leaning more on that owie side. And it also looks kind of funny too. So that's why you wanna think about using a cane if you have an ailment, whether it's a weakness, a, a pain, or just something that's just not working great. Post polio, we get some of those patients. You're gonna use it on the opposite side, okay? With the walker, same thing. If this is too tall, it actually becomes less stable. So again, if you look here, this is too tall for me. It's too tall by about five inches. It becomes less stable. Yes, I'm standing up taller, but I'm not really stable. It actually needs to be a little bit lower, okay? With a walker, you just push and, and walk with it. The thing we see a lot with walkers is that people either have them too far away, so they're not near it, and then they're wobbly, or they're too close to it and they can't walk either. So the proper area that you wanna kind of be in with the walker is right by the back side here so that you're a little bit in front, it's not getting away from you and that you're not too close to it where you're bumping in, okay? And again, we would lower this one down about five inches because it's too tall for me, okay? All right, and that was that. I'm gonna go back to the other screen share. So you can see that red line in there showing where that handle should be for the cane. And then if we go to the next one, uh oh, there it is. There we go. The walker at same thing, hips near, 
elbow a little bit bent and that red line's right along that area there by the wrist, okay? Most of the canes are pretty adjustable nowadays. We don't have to keep a hacksaw like we used to or a saw in the, the clinic. Believe it or not, the wooden canes, they were extra long so that we could literally shorten them to be perfect for you. But now with all the pins and great little maneuvering that we can do, we can adjust it, you know, an inch here and there without having to bring out the saw, which is really, really nice. So when to seek help? This is a question that a lot of people have. So anytime that you've had repeated falls, multiple falls, multiple close calls, so you're afraid of falling, that's when it's good to check with your primary care provider. Say, you know what? I almost fell this weekend and it scared, scared me. I'm, a, I'm now concerned. Maybe I should work on my balance. That's totally appropriate to see your primary care for. Sometimes you can do some of these visits over the phone with them or Zoom now with the current environment. Otherwise, they'll have you come in for an office visit and just make sure everything else is good. And then they'll usually send you off to physical therapy to give you something that's really, really safe. So just that mere presence of, or awareness that you're afraid of falling, it's completely covered. Medicare would rather have you not fall because you're concerned of falling than have to treat you because you did fall. So it is a considered diagnosis. We have a few in the ICD-10 codes, unsteadiness on feet, repeated falls, difficulty walking. All of those are totally appropriate to see a specialist for if you're concerned. So if any of those exercises that I showed you in that handout didn't look like you were comfortable with, those would be totally fine to seek help for. Or if you have diabetes or you have atrial fib or you have some ailment that you're just like, I don't know if it's safe for me to exercise. That's where a physical therapist comes in as well. We're trained to actually help you with all of navigating that, whether it's diabetes, atrial fib, Parkinson's, post polio, we've seen it all. We're trained for all of that. So when you have these ailments that you're just like, I know I should do something, but I'm not sure if it's safe go ahead and ask the doctor. We can help you with that. Again, we'd rather have you not fall and have you be strong and give you a specialized plan for something that's going to be better for you. Okay. So don't wait to have a fall is my last little closing line. And I'll open it up to questions for anybody in the audience. And I guess through Zoom, I don't know how that'll work, but <laughs> we'll figure it out. If you're on Zoom, uh, the way that you ask a question is through the chat uh, or by raising your hand. We have one uh, question on the chat. We have a hand raised when it gets to us. Well, let's start in the Burger Center. Are there any questions? Yes, there is. Thank you, Serena. What a really informative, useful talk. I guess I have a little bit of a little bit of a dilemma. Um, my uh, primary care physician asked me to do a bone density test about a year ago, and it came back with me bordering on osteopenia, probably closer to osteoporosis. And he recommended, uh, I think uh, it's a Fosinex type of medication. And after reading about it and the side effects, it kind of scared me away. Uh, my brother is a pharmacist, and I talked to him at length about it. And he has had the same diagnosis from his doctor, and he is not taking the medication. But I see from, from your presentation that maybe there's certain strengthening exercises that I could be doing, still not take the medication, and maybe not worsen my overall chances. Yeah, so you're absolutely correct. Um, I do a talk also on osteoporosis and osteopenia. So I am versed in this. And this is something that we see quite often as well with our patients. So um, you're correct. A lot of people are afraid when you see the side effects of some of the pharmacological options. And the neat thing about muscles and bones is as I mentioned in the beginning, they're living tissue. So if you put the right forces on them, they can get a little bit stronger and studies do support that. So usually what we do is we ask for your DEXA scan. We wanna know the T-score, which is how they determine how porous your bones are. And then we like to know what area is your weakest spot? Is it your spine or is it your hip? 
based on that, we can give you exercises that can help to basically make that area a little less vulnerable. It takes just, it takes a few months for some results to come in. So usually you're not gonna see anything different um, on your scan, but they usually don't do them for about a year anyways. But it is an option that we get a lot of patients coming in for because a lot of people would rather try and fix it through exercise and movement first. The medication's going to be there if it fails. So you can always try it first and the medication will be there if the doctor wants to talk you into it next time. But yeah, a physical therapist could help design what would be safe for you that wouldn't, prov wouldn't uh, cause additional issues, if that makes sense. That's a great question. George? Uh, Anna, you had a question. Um, when using hand weights, what recommendations can you give with regard to wrist, et cetera? Are you talking about wrist, wrist. pain or just um, style? Anna, do you have any clarification you'd like to give? <laughs> yes. Um, I, I was thinking about um, is wrist, wrist issues, maybe just weak wrists or arthritis in wrists, or maybe even carpal tunnel. Um, so those kinds of issues. Yeah, so with um, wrist issues, if you have any of those, they do have the little slip on wrist weight guys. I usually recommend to patients for the, that have that to use the stretch bands because you can wrap those around. You don't have to grip them really hard. And then you have a variety of resistance without actually having to grip something. You can just let the, the tensile of wrapping that rubber band around your hand and then looping it underneath your foot to do like a biceps curl or an out to the side. And you don't have to actually grip it as much if you have arthritis. Um, so that's where those stretchy bands come in really, really handy, whether it's a ribbon or the spaghetti noodle um, shape, they both do the same thing. So whatever you can find um, might be more versatile than actually getting um, two, three, four, five pound weights. Hopefully that answered your question. And I, I have a question yeah. for you. Mm -hmm. um, when people have a hip fracture and they have surgery, um, would you talk about that? and about aftercare in yeah. terms of movements that you should avoid? Yeah, so it depends on what you have done. <laughs> if you have a hip replacement with that hip fracture, they sometimes limit you from the crossing the leg at the knee and bending beyond 90 degrees. So, um, and they don't like you to um, turn the toe in when you're weighted. So those are things that they'll go over with you, but it kind of depends on what you have done. So if you break that surgical neck, sometimes they just put a pin in and you aren't restricted from any of those things. But if you do a number on yourself and they do a replacement with it, they sometimes will limit you from some of those movements. And the physician, after they're in and they do their surgery, they're going to be able to tell you what your precautions are. And so from that, that comes on the order for physical therapy where we basically follow those orders and show you how to do things without breaking those precautions. Um, so that's one of the things uh, in terms of precautions. Exercise wise, depending on how bad the break is, they usually want you into physical therapy pretty darn quick afterwards, usually within a week of being discharged from the hospital. And so we usually start out with exercises and movement and then get you up and moving and walking um, so that you basically are, are mobile as soon as possible. Mobility is good for everything, including reducing blood clots, which is why they don't let you guys rest in bed anymore when you're in the hospital. It's pretty much off the table. They're always getting you up, poking, prodding you, even if it just gets to the chair. And so physical therapy also helps with that as well to get you moving. And then we go through the exercises at a safe pace. So we'll go with strengthening and working on those muscles that need to be strong to help support that new metal component that they put in, whether it's the full, um, all the um, hip um, two points, or if it's just a one plate, it, it really depends. Sometimes they have to attach the ball of the head on, it just, depending on what you do. George? Uh, yes, um, whoever is iPad uh, had a question or iPhone, iPhone had a question. If you could ask it, please.
All right. Let me ask it. Um, uh, starts by thanking you for your talk. What can an individual do when soreness and light pain occur after doing things at the house? You know, uh, ladder, squatting, what is that? Yeah. So it's called the late onset muscle soreness. It's a, it's kind of bittersweet. <laughs> so it's good from a physical therapy standpoint, because you push that muscle just enough to get some change. So that little bit of soreness the next day usually lasts anywhere between 24 and 40 and 72 hours after actually is your muscle changing and getting stronger. So that little bit of soreness is not a bad thing. It's not fun, which is why it's bittersweet. The thing that you can do to help with it are things that reduce inflammation. So I usually recommend to people throw an ice pack on it. It's trigger point to that area. So if it's just your shoulder, put an ice pack on the shoulder. If it's just your quad, put an ice pack on your quad for about 10 minutes. That therapeutic window is 10 to 20 minutes. So anything less than 10 is not going to be very effective. Anything more than 20 isn't really doing anything more. So you have that window to do it. You can do it a few times a day. Some people will use some over-the-counter stuff like Arnica creams or muscle creams or Asper cream. Um, all of those topicals are okay. Um, whatever one's worked for you in the past. There's a new push on turmeric. There's still studies going out to see if that's helpful. And then anything that your physicians okayed you in the past as over-the-counter anti-inflammatory also can help. So you're going to follow whatever your physicians recommended based on your pharmacological well-being with whatever else you're taking, um, and then follow the bottle as instructed or whatever the physicians instructed you in the past. So think anti-inflammatory because that's really what's happening. It's a little bit of an inflammatory response from being pushed beyond the limit to get stronger. Uh, Iris had a question or comment. She's first. <laughs> um, I had a total left hip 15 years ago and I've always been super active and continue to do so. I've had no problems with it until the last few months and it's been slipping. And so I had an x-ray of it and it shows that the cap oh. the joint fits into is worn out and has to be replaced. And I have never talked to anybody who had had that done. I wondered what kind of a surgery it is and recovery. And I would hope it wouldn't be like the total hip. So it, it is a resurfacing. Um, I would plan honestly for it to be like the total hip. But the good thing is it's only one side. So it would be more like a hemiarthroplasty. So they're only going to probably be replacing the socket part, it sounds like. Um, so it would probably be a little bit less lengthy, still going to be tender, unfortunately, because they have to put a new socket in. Um, but yeah, I would, I would assume that it's probably going to be a month or two of physical therapy afterwards. After 15 years, it's more common. Yeah, unfortunately, as so bones and muscles are living tissue, which is great because they can accommodate and adapt. But unfortunately, when we put the plastic and the metal in, it is what it is and it may wear out over time. So they usually don't like to give hip and knee replacements to people in their forties like me, because they know that they're going to have to revise it at some point in time. They usually try and make you wait till you get into the sixties before you have it done. So the chances of you having to revise it go down, but it does happen, unfortunately. And usually when you get in that 15, 20 year mark is when we see some more of those happen. The technology is better. The incisions are smaller than when you had the last one. And the literature and research indicate that getting up and moving sooner actually promotes the healing process. So hopefully it'll be a much better experience second time around um, than your first experience. I mean, that was relevant. One moment here. We could, yep. George, I'm sure there's another one online that I think I- We've got at least two more online. Okay. Um, uh, is it safe to use light ankle weights in exercising? Absolutely. Yeah, we strap the ankle weights on people all the time at the clinic. I don't recommend walking for exercise with them. Um, you're, if you wanna add weight, get a vest, that's safer. 
um, because I don't want you tripping because you didn't lift your foot high enough up. But for those out to the side exercises or the first one forward or the back, back on that page with the leg exercises, absolutely. Ankle weights are great. Um, as long as you can get them on and off yourself, you can do your exercises and then take them off while you're back around walking in the house or out, out and about, yeah. And finally, um, I think you already said this, but let me just recheck it. Uh, is there any way to uh, access your services other than going through your primary position and getting a uh, script? Generally in California, we do have direct access, but that limits a person to 12 visits before they have to seek out medical help. So you can self-refer yourself. Usually when you self-refer yourself for our office, we will then send that evaluation to your primary care. So if they know that you are concerned about your balance, they usually sign off on it and say, okay, and then you're fine. But if you decide to come in and you don't have a primary care, which is uncommon, but it does happen, you are locked out at 12 visits, unfortunately, through the California law that doesn't allow us to do more than 12 visits without you seeing a physician. They figure if it's more than 12 visits needed, there's probably more going on than just a general tune-up, if that makes sense. And hopefully that answered that question. And we've had a number of comments online thanking you so much for a great presentation and congratulating you on your uh, OSPT move. <laughs> Well done, thank you. All right.